As we, again, as we're sitting down, let me set you up. Okay, so you are. Anywhere you, there are only two chairs, yes, so anywhere so you want. Like You're our guest, ma'am. Which one do you want? You sit on the yes, left. ma'am. Which is politically probably right. I'll be on the right, you'll be on the left. Okay. Move it as fast as I can, ma'am. <laughs> yes. So um, our instructions for this closeout session were we were supposed to be funny and we were supposed to include myths and substantively we were supposed to, you know, raise the the knowledge level. So I said, I'm not funny. I'll do the myths. Dan will be funny. So you're on, Dan. No pressure. Tell us Thank about you. North Carolina. Great. Well, can we give another round of applause for that excellent presentation? <laughs> Just a few things to do before uh, dinner tonight. Not too much to work on after a long two-day conference. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here and for persevering. Um, my name is Dan Gerlach. I'm the president of the Golden Leaf Foundation in Rocky Mount. And uh, we are the largest uh, uh, private philanthropy out on the east, uh, east of 95 in our state. And so we're delighted to welcome you here and thank you for all the work you're doing here, Emily. I, I think a couple things about North Carolina and why I'm optimistic about it. One is that, is the lady from Reynoldsburg still here? The lady who was Reynoldsburg, Ohio? Well, Reynoldsburg is a suburb. Uh, maybe some of you went to her panel. She's from the east side of Columbus, Ohio, my native town. And Mary Linda and I, we're from Ohio. And we moved here as fast as we can. The rest of the state's coming. <laughs> and we're going to go on all the talent. So this is a place that even during the recession, uh, people has attracted more people. We, we are a growing state because people like it here. We are a state that has a lot of optimism about it because of our geographic location. Not only on the eastern seaboard are we centrally located and have an excellent transportation system up and down. Usually, I know there's some flight issues from time to time, but Definitely. but 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 we are in a good geographic location. And I think equally as importantly, when we're talking about a 21st century economy, is our location, uh, our, our reach to Europe. Mm -hmm. Because the European Union is in some trouble right now, and there are going to be a lot of their private sector industries, if they have such a thing over there, <laughs> that are going to want to locate on the eastern side of the United States. And a lot of them are, are some of the mainline advanced manufacturing companies in the world. And we are, it is my goal to help North Carolina be as home to as many of them as possibly we can do. So there are a lot of things, advantages that North Carolina has already uh, to, uh, to position ourselves well, well for the challenges that you set before us today. I, I think the second thing that, that we have uh, to struggle with too is, it, on the other hand, is, uh, is an idea that we are a state where you're here in the Research Triangle Park, but not every place in our state is like that. A lot of our philanthropies, a lot of our businesses, a lot of our government is concerned about making sure that all of North Carolina is prosperous. And so our foundation was set up to help replace some of the wealth lost to these declining traditional industries, lost as the tobacco crop declines in importance. But I have to tell you that in a lot of rural North Carolina, there's still, despite poverty, despite uh, hardship, there is a lot of opportunity to build on this reshoring of American manufacturing to rebuild on the finest agricultural and most diverse agricultural sector, uh, certainly uh, west of the east of Illinois. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to build on uh, people who are at a point in time where we have to do something. So it is our mission. We have funded a lot of this, uh, a lot of these innovative ideas uh, that, that we have talked about throughout the conference and that you uh, outlined for us today. I think on this notion of skills gap, if I might, and then I'll I'll hush. Uh, no, go, go. Uh, on skills gap is the idea here. It strikes me is one of the things that that I say, like you, not everybody needs a four year degree. But let me say, says, what's your daughter going to do? I go, well, she's going to get her butt to a four year college. <laughs> uh, and and how many of you are afflicted with that? Right. We say what she just said, but how many of your children are going to four year colleges? The thing is, what we have to concentrate. It's not a choice of education. It's a choice of what kind of education. It is not a choice about whether my child goes to four year edge four-year college or not. It is a choice of giving people the opportunity, starting probably in middle school, on through high school, to determine that there is a place for them in the American workforce. That when their father or mother comes home, laid off from mm -hmm. Pillatex or VF Micro in Bertie County, which happened the same day in eastern North Carolina as Pillatex closed, and probably had a more dramatic effect on that county than Pillatex did in Cabarrus, that, that there's still hope for that young person that they don't have to turn to alternative forms of, uh, of a subterranean economy to drop out to give up. We have to keep engaging them, as so many of you are doing and are, are being heroic about it, to do so. 
we also have a responsibility beyond what you said as a, just as educators and business people and people who think about things, is, is people to realize that when these kids come to school, they don't have the family support, the church support, the community support, as you and I were talking about before, uh, before the session started, Emily, that these teachers are being forced to do that. That is not acceptable here, it is not acceptable in the United States. What it has to be is a resurgence of engagement in how it is acceptable again to have all of us look after the community of children of which our child is uh, one among a number of. And that will help relieve some of this pressure on teachers and let them do what they went to school to, and went to, gave up a part of their lives to do their public service. And so we have to talk about one of the ways to, some of the ways to do that. We do that through community engagement in their communities. We do through that through helping people who are adults think about the vision they want for their children and engage through our own, mm -hmm. participating in our own grants making. And we do that by trying to bring economic opportunity right now to those counties. Because if it doesn't come right now, we're gonna lose the brain, we're gonna, that brain drain is gonna accelerate out of rural North Carolina. And that to me is an unacceptable outcome. It would mean I failed in uh, achieving my agency's mission. And that would be bad. So that's kind of some general thoughts I had running around. I didn't, and maybe yeah, and, and they're huge thoughts. And as you can tell, we've had this conversation about the community engagement and, right. and really the many new challenges this generation of teachers must confront as we have a nation where uh, two parent families and community support and engagement with a faith-based organization is not for the majority of kids coming in the classroom today. And somehow we've all just decided, well, the schools can resolve those problems while they're providing an sure. academic foundation. And then, oh, by the way, they also need work-based learning or, or applied learning opportunities. You know, by the way, you need to emphasize STEM. So it is a pylon that happens to teachers, to educators, and the educational system has been blamed for a lot of what are real societal and cultural issues. And we're trying to move that aside because if I found anything in North Carolina, Dan, in my many uh, trips down here, always it seems at a period or time of crisis and need, um, it's the, the in, incredible spirit of North Carolinian and North Carolinians from the rural communities and counties sure. to the urban areas. There's always a next opportunity. And we were just talking with Matt from the community college system about this being uh, probably the nation's greatest East Coast, at least agricultural economy with potential for export, potential for impact right. in the homeland security, a focus now on food safety with the use of um, food products or agricultural products for fuel and energy. Um, a huge new area of opportunity for North Carolina. And every time I've been here, someone somewhere in the system has identified that next big step and then rallied the necessary parties to make it happen. Right. And you and Gold, Gold Leaf have been an important part of making that happen. So I'm very impressed with it. I think what Dan and I would like, if there, um, is certainly if there are any questions from the floor, we'd like to make sure you have an opportunity to ask those. I think you're just dying to know more about Washington. Who cares, right? Um, right. <laughs> Right, you're the, you weren't oh, supposed sorry. to say right. Excuse me, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, he and I, I were missed, kind of there together. I, I, I missed my cue time. on that, I guess. I missed your cue. No questions? Well, I think, yeah. go, go ahead, Tony, okay. How do we prevent Washington from occurring here? Um, oh. You mean the partisanship and the, the yeah. How do we get through that to create well, that's a good question. Honestly, I haven't seen any state capital or state legislature that's in the gridlock that Washington is in. So let's hope that, uh, you know, it stays there. Um, actually, I hope they fix it, but uh, better to have your state legislature prepared to act. And I'm sure Dan knows far more about the dynamics of your current state legislature, but I think you're, what I see is a huge window of opportunity a legislature that, at least initially, has started to percolate some education and workforce development reform ideas in the form of bills, some not so good, but 
Um, there's, there's thinking and, and talking going on. And a new governor who really can work with a clean slate um, in terms of his ideas and presenting them to the, uh, to the state legislature. The power is going to come for the governor, assuming he has great ideas, and I will, I'm going to assume that, will come if business steps up to the plate as his support mechanism. Because everybody in the legislature, any politician at any level, knows it is about jobs and opportunities within their communities, their districts, and their regions. And without the business executives driving that, we can't get there. And that's been the problem in this from a national basis. I think North Carolina is ready for that leadership. So I think it's doable. So well, can, and I think it's doable as well because nothing begets success like success. Mm -hmm. And I think you, if, if the governor is able to and, and, and the legislature is able to get some things that people see some progress on that makes sense to, to middle class parents and their families especially and their children, then I, I think it will be, uh, things will work well. I mean, we're, uh, our, uh, you and I were talking about we've had a quite a political change here, a very dramatic political change in, mm -hmm. in what party holds the power here in North Carolina. But I think that, that you're right about the engagement of business at all levels. The businesses here who appear up on the screen, whose names appear here, whose, whose people are here, they're already part of the converted, right? Absolutely. The problem comes to me is at the local level when businesses will come up to me and tell me about the problems, but they'll never have communicated the problems to their school board or their, their, schools, their school principals or anything else to tell them this needs to change. There hasn't been that conversation as comprehensively across the state as I would have liked. I think investing in leadership training of school board members and school superintendents is essential to getting this mm -hmm. done, as is the professional development. If we want people to use the highest, uh, uh, the, the best technology available to do teaching and learning, the best material from Pitsco or whatever uh, to, to do, uh, to help bring the students apart, we have to do professional development well and businesses have to be engaged, not just the, the, the major ones that are here today, but at all levels in order to, to uh, succeed. I think, too, the third thing I, I would say, my number's three still, sorry, very um, biblical name. You have to come up with two more. I, I, I can't. Uh, three is, uh, uh, I, I think that, that everything that came before is not wrong. There are some great reforms here. I would say early, early colleges, I would say there's a lot Absolutely. of strengths here that North Carolina has to, to bid on. And the language that we use when you're making the changes says is not that everything sucks and we need to make it, you know, we just need to start all over. But the thing is, we want to be good, but we're not great yet, and we want to be great. Because we don't know, as long as we're failing some children, we don't know which child out there at Edgecombe County or, or uh, Hertford County or, or Cherokee County is going to be the one to lead the next great business, to find the cures for these diseases that bedevil us to be the next governor of North, you know, the future governor of North Carolina. So we need to, uh, to work on that first, and I think we can get there. But I am not, state governments by nature are more practical than Washington, and I think that that gridlock will not happen. But if we spend all our time talking about how it could happen, then we may bring it upon we ourselves. Bring it upon us. Let, let me make one other comment about the educational ecosystem, as um, actually uh, Tony and I were talking about. I, I use the term pathway, um, and I love edu educational pathways and alternative educational pathways, but that sounded too linear, I think. Um, so I'm trying to adapt my, my verbiage here to the educational ecosystem. What's important about that is we do in this country, and you in North Carolina, have really world-class university system, no doubt about it. I will tell you, who's some, as someone who's both invested in and um, been involved in policy at the national level, your community college system is just about the best in the nation. You didn't pay me for that, right, Matt? Um, seriously, you know I feel that way. Um, and, and there are a couple of others I could cite, but this one is damn good. And now you've got North Carolina new schools who are really changing the face of what the rest of the country calls K-12 and addressing issues like those lost 11th and 12th grade years, moving to 
something other than seat time, getting to competency bases, getting the core competencies that align to the economy. So three big institutional parts of the continuum of education. If they don't come together with their vision about yeah. this expanded opportunity for young people to pursue those um, Right. various pathways of their choice uh, and their ability, then none of it will be successful. And I can tell you I have been in places where the university system will fight to remain traditional. And the governor's, their governor's response to that is to bring in a non-traditional competing competency-based university as the governor's university that provides better access at lower cost with fully accredited degrees and challenged the university system. The community colleges are kind of the darling of the current national administration. Uh, so there are lots of resources coming in. They are at a, a kind of keystone position to link to the great programs in your um, new schools initiative and to be either both pathways to employment immediately and pathways to the university system for higher level degrees, plus the place where transitioning workers can quickly take an on-ramp on to gain some new skills so they're employable and get off whenever they choose to for that job. Uh, so you've got all the component parts and they're all powerful and they all have their own constituencies. They all have their own political. So this is gonna be t the tough part of creating an educational ecosystem that you all rally around a strategy that says, you know what, as a ecosystem, as a total system, pre-K through gray, um, we are, in fact, the workforce development system in North Carolina. We are the economic development system in North Carolina, and we are the education system in North Carolina. You can't do better than that, because along with taking that responsibility as a system, come the resources, the policy, the investment you'll need to be successful. So that's a big task. If you do that, you will lead the nation, but there won't be many that are very far behind you because they're running like mad to see that vision and strategy in their state as well. Well, you get to the point across the education systems. I mean, the, the entire difference, and we get our tax burden is uh, pointed to as higher as some of the other southeastern states. And, the challenge there is if you look at the entire difference between our tax burden and Florida, it is our subsidy to the university system. Accounts for more than the total gap altogether. It is the university system has been well resourced by the leaders of the state for a long, long time. And the K-12 system has been under-resourced compared nationally right. to the rest of it. So the university system sits there and wonders, why isn't K-12 doing a better job? They need to become, and the community colleges have a role in this too, is to become better advocates for the K-12 system so that the money that the community college system now spends on remediation oh can God, be yeah. saved or the university system where I have taught graduate classes, Emily, where students, I have to put on papers, sentences need nouns and verbs, where commas are your friends. Feel free to avail yourself of their use. <laughs> and beyond STEM, it gets to, to the idea of we need basic communication skills to any company sitting here, any business, anybody, if we don't have fundamental reading and writing skills and oral communication skills, th then this, the whole talk about STEM is, is, is uh, not going to advance very far. And I think moreover that, that the point is, is we have to talk to parents very frankly about what awaits them. Because uh, back in 2006 there was some polling done, not saying who did it, but that uh, <laughs> the question was uh, we need to have schools with more global standards to be much more diligent in preparing our kids for the global economy. Or, t or alternative is students in high school need some time to acclimate, they're growing to be teenagers, to be young people. They need to, they're already under a lot of pressure. We need to not put so many pressure on them. And it was this answer that got the majority of it. Now, so I'm a parent of a 15 year old, don't worry, she looks like her mother. But she, uh, right now we say, that there's a struggle going on. I mean, are we putting too much pressure on her? And my wife says to me, and don't you repeat this to Peggy Gerlach, she says to me, Dan, I mean, 
how is she, if she has all this time, she's just going to study, take AP, this, honors, this. She's never going to be able to date. I'm like, yes, now we're getting <laughs> now somewhere. We're That's the whole point of it. I'm sorry. I, I just that. For all of you with daughters, you understand that. Yes, we do.